everybody. Welcome to Design Details here at Music Effect Design. I'm Jordan Pittner, one of your hosts, a uh, drill writer and music educator from Phoenix, Arizona. And my name is Mike Kruger. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm a music educator, arranger, and composer. Hi, my name is Holly Paxton. I'm a colored art instructor based in Phoenix, Arizona. Hey, thanks to everybody who's checked us out over the last few weeks. We've had some great, uh, some great guests and we have another one here with us tonight. Um, Jeff, welcome to the show. Howdy, howdy. Uh, Jeff, would you like to tell the audience a little bit more about who you are and, and what you do in the... In sure. The uh, currently, I am the Southwest District Manager for Yamaha School Service Sales Division. Uh, used to be called Bannon Orchestra, so I am basically responsible for all instrument sales uh, in California, Arizona, and Nevada in terms of band and orchestra instruments. Uh, before that, I was a self-employed percussion educator. Uh, I taught at Butler University as adjunct faculty, was actually artist in residence there for a year, um, taught at a couple different high schools, Carmel High School and Avon High School out in Indianapolis. And then before that was a touring performer with Blast. And then before that was uh, like in retail store management and everything. So all of that came kind of full circle <laughs> now. Uh, <laughs> where I, I, I landed here now. So I um, used to judge and still write a little bit here and there as well. So cool. I, love the, I love the Benjamin Button introduction. <laughs> kind of, kind of from I didn't, think about, I didn't mean to go backwards, but I, you, know, you start with what you do now and then it's like, well, <laughs> that's awesome. Know, what does being a salesman have to do with this thing? But there's right. all that stuff that came before that. So no, it's, it's cool to see the path. We really appreciate your time here. Uh, oh, my here pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. So if anybody's tuning in for the, for the first time, we've been in, this is our percussion week at Music Effect Design. We talked a little bit through uh, uh, Jeff Larch, our in-house percussion arranger earlier this week, talked a little bit about what his process is like. And we wanted to have Jeff on today to really talk about kind of kind of where he is and, and his experience and what keeps him going. So Jeff, um, yep. I, in, in doing a little research for our uh, interview here, I learned a little bit about your role at Yamaha. Would you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing now? Sure. Um, so right about a year ago, um, I well, let me back up just a little bit. So I had been looking for uh, jumping out of the self-employed world um, and getting, you know, a quote unquote real job as I've jokingly said it, but uh, uh, just, you know, one with benefits and retirement. So I've been looking at an industry position for a number of years. I always thought that would be a nice transition out of the teaching world and into something that, um, you know, could sustain for, you know, my, the last sort of chapter of my life, if you will, in terms of employment. So I had been looking at this particular job as a Yamaha district manager for a number of years, actually interviewed a couple times along the way. Uh, also was just kind of keeping my ear to the ground, trying to find something that I thought I would really be able to enjoy. I, I, I have a firm belief that you must enjoy what you're doing. Otherwise, what's the point? So, you know, I, I had learned a lot about this type of position from the people that, that currently held it. Uh, when it came open, uh, put my resume where I kind of always had a, a working resume, to be honest, uh, to be able to submit and to just sort of say, hey, if this sounds like something I'd want to do. So I had been an artist with Yamaha since either 2012 or 2013. So I got to be pretty knowledgeable about the company and their products through that. And then obviously just being 
you know, in the teaching world and performing for, for as long as I had been, had met a ton of people and, you know, always the people I met at Yamaha, I just couldn't say enough about. They were just great people. I started to really also look at how many people had this particular job with, with Yamaha and nobody ever leaves, you know, it's kind of like a Supreme Court mm-hmm. justice in a sense. I mean, people <laughs> get in here and they don't go anywhere. Uh, so that's what bothers <laughs> me about the company, about the position itself, about it's, you know, the enjoyability of it and the sustainability of it as well. So was thrilled when I was able to earn the position, um, right, like I said, right about a year ago, it's a year and almost a month to the day. So I am responsible for primarily dealing with music retailers in Arizona, Nevada, and California. I'm responsible for all three of those states. Um, a secondary focus is with educators like yourselves and trying to help them with products or with clinics and things like that, sort of facilitating stuff that's within my territory in that realm. Uh, and then also dealing with artists, but it's kind of a, a, a tiered thing where sort of the dealers are, are my primary thing and then educators, universities, schools kind of underneath that, and then helping facilitate clinics and things like that, that happen in my territory as well. Wow. So you've been there about a year. What's your, what's your favorite part of your day to day? Well, currently that I get to sit at home and stare out a window every day uh, and do Zoom calls. Uh, now, like what I think, what, some of the, what's really cool about the job is, you know, I've always been pretty, tra- I've always traveled a fair amount. So this job um, is kind of cool because, you know, let's all speak in terms of normal terms. Like I'm on the road uh, a fair amount, but I kind of get to go out and back because of the density of Southern California is probably where the primary um, concentration of my dealers are. Um, I do get to travel a fair amount. I go out to Arizona every now and then. Um, actually, my territory just recently expanded to include Northern California, and my family's up there too. So there's some great sort of perks about that. You know, actually, my all all members of my family actually live either in Arizona or Northern California, or me and my wife are down here. So it's kind of cool that they all my family is within my territory. So that's certainly a perk. Um, the job itself is great. You know, it's it's very social in the sense that you get to go out and you see people. There's not really the day that's the same. It's it's in a way a, a very similar job to the teaching world where you know each day presents its own challenges and especially the self-employed world where you you know you created your own schedule, you set your lessons, you knew you were going to the school at, at whatever time, all that. So I think for me and, and the transition out of, you know, self-employed musician teacher world into this, it's a nice little balance of kind of self-employment. My actual boss lives in Dallas, Texas. Um, so, you know, we check in every now and then. And certainly as I was learning the job, there was a lot more close contact and that contact is beginning to get further and further. As long as I'm on top of things, there's you know no real reason for anybody to, to sort of you know, look over my shoulder, so to speak. But um, yeah, I'm definitely still learning things. I love it. It's quite invigorating to do, um, a whole new career to a point at, you know, 46 or whenever it is that I actually started the job. So yeah, it's, I, I am really excited about the next 15, 20 years and, and, um, what this holds. It's, it's been a great opportunity so far. I, I have a, a question about just, uh, I guess a quick question about that. Um, mm-hmm. the, there's a lot of folks who I talk to, um, who, you know, kind of in their life have gone from freelance to teaching or vice versa, or they switch around um, or, or things kind of change up. Do you ever find the, fr- like what you were doing before you moved for this? Um, do you ever find that background influencing what you do currently? Um, oh, absolutely. Like, oh yeah? Awesome. Yeah, oh, by far, because really, I mean, I'm dealing with music stores who deal with educators. So I'm able mm-hmm. to not only bring a bit of a sales background from granted from a long time ago, um, but also take the educator point of view of, Hey, here, I, I know your customer pretty well. So, you know, it's, I, I, I find that that helps a ton in terms of being able to effectively do my job now. Yeah. I would imagine that also just makes it maybe more fun just for you. Like in general, I would imagine talking to, talking to your people, you know, oh, yeah, it's yeah. great. Yeah, like I said, I think this, this was really the perfect cool. job for me if, if I were to leave teaching and clearly I did. So there you go. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about your time in education. Um, Mm -hmm. So I know, granted, we have a lot of questions about what the next year is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Um, And those things notwithstanding, because hopefully people are tuning in and listening to to these things over time. Um, If, uh, so we've got a band camp season coming up, right? In theory. (laughs) Um, What, when you're thinking about planning for your for your groups that you've worked with in the past, what's a good timeline for a high school program? 
Uh, well, it really depends on what the end goal is. So, you know, with with my most recent experiences at Carmel and Avon, you know, the end goal was BOA. And, and really with Avon, the end goal was BOA and WGI. So you're sort of looking at your whole, the whole year in that sense. Right. Um, you know, I started, there hadn't been a winter drumline at Carmel for a number of years. And I was, got that kind of back off the ground again uh, out there. So then we would look through, you know, we didn't ever actually get to compete at WGI. We were still building the program as it went, but you know, we were still looking at state finals then too. So really you're looking at both seasons as how you're going to prepare and approach each individual season in that sense. So, you know, we would start doing design meetings and to be clear, at, at, I didn't really, I didn't write for Carmel or Avon in the fall. Um, Jay Webb wrote the percussion book at Avon when I was there and Mike McIntosh still continues to write the percussion book at Carmel. Um, I did facilitate a little bit of that in the winter with both programs. But so from a design standpoint, those meetings would be happening, you know, they'd start in the wintertime for the fall, you know, and they would really start to look at, you know, what are we looking at numbers wise? What are, what are we sort of projecting there? And then, you know, they'd start throwing ideas and, and really start to get the ball rolling. Ideally, the show was done in terms of conceptually before we even got out of school, you know, like we would have usually like a, a kind of first rehearsal end of April, usually at Carmel, you know, and it was just sort of a get together and we would start audition process at that point and everything too. And we would want to push through that as, as quickly as we could to get everybody set on their given instruments um, and then move into band camp. So we would, uh, I'd have to look at a schedule. It's, it's already for, sort of faded from my mind a little bit, but basically, you know, we would do, as soon as school got out, we would do, you know, maybe three days a week from like one to nine uh, for maybe two weeks in a row um, and then a little bit of time off. And then we would do uh, a couple, two or three more camps and then we would have three weeks off and then we would come back and hit it hard uh, for two weeks um, going into the school year. What I liked about the Carmel schedule a lot was that it was Monday through Thursday, no matter what we were doing. You know, the first couple of weeks, I think was Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, <laughs> but then we would never do weekends. So the intensity was cool because you always knew that you had a long weekend there and actually right. mm -hmm. helped families plan for travel and, and that type of thing. And then after 4th of July, we would always have three weeks off and then we'd come back for that. So saying all of that to put then the design process in perspective you know we would coordinate with the designers on when we would want to have stuff we would be able to try to say hey we want to have you know we've got a big camp coming up can we make sure we get the next chart or the next chunk and all of that so like the timeline would start you know early you know probably february ish mm -hmm. and then just start the discussions keep it moving and then just everybody staying in touch you know and the more that the team worked together the more that that got more streamlined and you know, the ideas flew, uh, started flowing and, and moving it along. I, I kind of want to take it, uh, what Jordan was asking, you know, he was asking, you know, about, you know, the timeline. I, I kind of want to take it even more extreme on a, on a different end. And my question is, is, is a lot of times, you know, educators when they get their first job, they graduate in May and they might not enter into their position until May or June, right? For their first mm -hmm. position. So if you're a new director, and your new say you have a whole new staff and you have August 1st as your band camp and all of a sudden you got into your position. Do you have any ideas or suggestions or tips on like just even an abbreviated, like I have two months to make sure my drum line is successful sure. on that field. Okay, and like, I how do you go about anything maintenance? Yeah. And all? I think there's a couple prongs to that. I, th I do think for any new director coming in, it's, it's wise obviously depending every situation is different right but right. when i like for example when i came into carmel i wanted to keep as much of the staff in place that i could because they just knew the system you know and, and right. certainly we had to get along so there was that whole process but you know you're in an area long enough you meet people you end up you know hanging with them socially in some way shape or form so i knew most of the folks that i was sort of inheriting from my staff i did bring some others with me but i wanted to be able to lean on them especially because you know they're the link to the kids you know i didn't want to kind of clean house so i would make that as a suggestion obviously with the caveat of making sure that everybody gets along and, and buys into whatever new philosophies are going to be brought in with a new director um then you want to be able to lean on them too in terms of inventory and maintenance and hey how has this typically gone who's the band booster president you obviously want to get all of your ducks in a row in terms of for lack of a better word to say sort of politically so you can have people on your side you know and and, and right. make sure that we're all coming together with a, a unified message not somebody that's completely over here and then trying to to rein their staff and you know there's bigger problems if that's happening 
so obviously try to work together to make that happen. So to answer your question uh, a little bit more directly there, Mike, is to, you know, get the inventory done, make sure that the gear's in good shape, uh, make sure that, you know, you understand the resources at your disposal, whether that's that you have them or you don't have them and how to then proceed mm -hmm. accordingly. You know, there's some schools um, that had like sort of unlimited repair budgets. I know that's not right. the case everywhere. So, okay, let's make a, a sort of triage list of what's the worst things that I need to take care of to get the kids in shape or get the gear in shape, probably harnesses and heads. You know, what's the stick situation? What's the mallet situation? Are there any cracked bars? All of those kinds right. of things. You know, really trying to make sure that the gear is going to provide the kids the best experience possible. I think that would probably be one of the first things. And then you're looking at obviously schedule, you know, to use the scenario of you get the job, you know, there's hopefully a ton going on behind the scenes after you get that job. And, and let's say you're, you know, again, your first rehearsals there in August, you've got the maintenance thing taken care of. Probably at that point, you don't have time to design a whole show. I would certainly recommend them looking at a canned show um, or something of that nature, you know, and, and, Really, obviously, you probably want to try to get an ability assessment of your students before then. So therefore, you're either leaning on the staff or you're, you know, saying, hey, this might be new, but we need to do a rehearsal in whatever day just so I can see everybody play. I can kind of have an idea so I know how to to best serve the students, too. So I think that would be something to look at for sure as well. Um, you know, there's lots of options out there. You know, there's lots of consultants and clinicians. Obviously, that's a world we live in now that certainly you can lean on. Uh, in that sense too, but just if if you're a new person coming in, you know, to sort of sum it up, I would say lean on the existing staff the best that you can. Uh, again, provided that you're philosophically aligned, make sure that you've planned an appropriate show. You know, I don't know, you know, that that first year on the job you want to change the world. I think you want to make sure that you acclimate and get people bought into your program at that point. So right. provide so provide an experience more than anything to the students that's going to be worthwhile and keep them coming back. You know, I think in any um, turnover situation, retention is always going to be an issue. So I think, I almost think it's, you know, clear, don't, don't not do, be who you are, teach your <laughs> philosophies, all those kinds of things, right? But make sure that you're very, you, you're aware of the experience that you're providing the kids. You know, if you're completely polar opposites of what was there before you, be smart about how you approach that. You know, be smart about how much change you try to uh, put in that first year. You know, and there's two philosophies of that too, really. One is rip the Band-Aid off and just go. And if they don't like it, okay, you know, you're going to be dealing with the core people that you have. And then the other is to maybe gradually steer the ship in the direction that you want to go. So, you know, that it's personality thing. You know, I, I'm usually more of a passive person for, for those types of things. So I kind of came in, took an assessment of the situation and said, hey, what's the, what, what can I do to best help with what exists and then, then work that way? You know, there's, there's always going to be things I think that you shouldn't compromise on. And there were things that I didn't. And clearly there was some pushback from some of the older students. And that happened at Avon too when I, when I got there. Um, so yeah, I mean, you just got to kind of pick your battles and, and stay true to yourself, bottom line, and then be able to, uh, again, provide a great experience to the kids is the most important thing. I, I love that. Uh, I've got a question in sort of the setup of your season for percussion. Uh, for more novice band directors that don't have a percussion background, what goes into deciding the, like, aud the audition process, I guess? Like, who goes battery, where they go in battery, they go front ensemble, that sure. kind of stuff. Yeah, so there's obviously a million philosophies for everything. So the way that I would approach it is I would, you know, you can make a broad statement that, you know, older players are going to be on the upper membranes and or the marimbas if you, you know, if we're going to look at the two. So sort of snare and quads to me is an equal skill. There's, there's different things involved with each of them, but in terms of a dexterity, a, a skill standpoint, pretty much the same skills are needed on both, right? So you could, you want more experienced players there. So you're going to look at people that have you know, the, the ability and the dexterity in their hands to do those skills, which, you know, would be, you know, too high, this, this um, ability, right? To be able to play accents and taps, good dynamics, rolls, flams, um, those types of rudimental skills. Bass drum is is that intermediate sort of thing. So you can certainly put a freshman on bass drum and, and be successful. You could put a freshman on snare drum too. It just obviously depends on their maturity and their hands. And that would go for everybody. Bass drum being that, you know, timing is, is of the utmost importance. Important. I want people that have good, good feet and that can interpret the beat well. Um, and, you know, certain things that you can do to try out bass drummers is just general timing patterns, you know, tap your foot, count out loud and play these, these patterns. Um, here's some different accent patterns. Here's some syncopated rhythms. Try these, 
tap your foot. If that looks good, then they'll probably be relatively successful in bass drum. So in a typical battery ensemble, you'd kind of round out with snares, uh, quads, and basses. Certainly there's cymbals. The whole single tenor thing is a new, you know, sort of new within the last 10, 12 years or so that's become pretty, pretty rampant. And I'm a huge fan of that. I think for students that want to march, it's a great place to start to hone that ability. You know, there are ways, I got to give Mac, Mike McIntosh credit in his arranging. Every year that we did that at Carmel, and I think all but one year that I was there, we did the single tenor line or duos just because when we had old tenors that we had and, and, and used that. He was masterful at integrating that voice to always have like one moment to where you said, oh, they're serving a purpose. They're not just there to be beating a silent head or something like that, like some people do. So uh, I thought that was great. You know, obviously the cymbal line too. So there are like skills in that sense to where you can have, you know, less experienced players on cymbals or these single tenors, et cetera. Looking at the pit, you know, the marimbas and then the vibes and then, you know, glock, bells, auxiliary, those types of things. So you can certainly orchestrate the pit in a way too, where you have, you know, the same way you kind of do a, a drum line where you put sort of the most experience with a section leader player in the middle. And then you sort of dilute from an ability standpoint, lack of a better way to say that, to the ends. It doesn't always mean if you're on the end, you're the worst player. It just means that, you know, you obviously want your strongest person in the center and then you can set the lineup for people that play well together or, you know, to, to help somebody with playing on the end is tough. So you want sort of that stereo sound. There's all sorts of little things that go into that. Same thing that you can set up a marimba line or a vibe line with. I mean, you can certainly within those ensembles orchestrate the parts to where, you know, the most difficult parts are to the experienced players. You can still put somebody with a little less experience on a marimba, but write a part that's maybe a little bit more comping or less independent mallet work, et cetera, for those um, outer instruments or for those less experienced players. I think one of the most important things to look at is to, again, the, the student experience, you know, what are they going to have, but to look ahead, you know, two or three or four years, right? Mm -hmm. Try to identify a trajectory of a student and certainly talk with them too, not just like, hey, you're going to do this and, you know, push them in that direction. But yes, I'd like you to do this and I'm going to push you in this direction kind of thing. But try to see where you think they can go, you know, and set goals for them and communicate with them that way too. So that way you can start to plan your group as you have people graduate, as you have, you know, people move through the whole program. So that's certainly something to think about in terms of who to put where. There's so much, um, for lack of a better way to say, you know, kid ego involved in it too. So there is a bit of making sure they understand the path that's being laid for them as well. Um, I know there were times, it's getting a little long-winded, but I know there were times that, uh, you know, a student wanted to play marimba, but just wasn't quite ready. But, you know, he may have had the hands or, or she may have had the hands to do it, but just maturity wise, they weren't ready for it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, I, I know you really want to do this. I understand that. But hey, there's a, also an opportunity to give you this little, virtuosic moment in the show too. And certainly I'm maybe talking a little bit more winter here where you can customize that to the players a little bit more. But I remember specifically a student, fantastic student. Uh, I think it was his sophomore year. He probably, he did have the hands to play marimba by far and he wanted to play marimba, but it was like, hey, we need a rock in the vibe section. Otherwise the vibes are gonna be floating with nobody you know, to listen to basically because they would all be less experienced. So we kind of pitched that to him, hey, here's a leadership role as well. But then we just made sure to give him a moment to where he could display his, his wares. And that really helped that whole thing along with that too. That's awesome. Yeah. I, it's a fantastic answer. So um, I, real quick, as we're going into this, I'm gonna probably got knocked off for some reason. If this stops streaming us, we'll just jump back in. And sure. See if I can get her back in here. Boom. I hope it shows her profile pic. Oh, no. oh, that's a good one. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't. That's too bad. All right, we'll show it up later. Cool. Welcome back. Well, Holly, I had a great answer to your question. You missed it all. She's like, I've heard enough. <laughs> that's enough of that. <laughs> cool. Let me Shush. Jeez. On, it like I clicked on the link, and they're like, the server to Zoom is down. I was like, how are they still on? That's <laughs> funny. So, I'm Jeff. Now. Oh. Jordan, you, you didn't go ahead. Yeah, my, I, just real quick, Jeff, because I love when you're talking about thinking about the long-term growth and health of the program through the members. Is that something that's on your mind throughout every season? Is it something you um, you spend some time on at a certain point? Like, like how do you kind of work through that? Uh, short answer is yes. I mean, it, it's on my mind 
the whole right. time. I mean, if you're not looking ahead, you're behind, really. I mean, right. if I think, you know, recruiting and looking, really, you're looking all around, right? You're looking at, at I was always trying to think of how I could grow the program, right? So mm -hmm. what experiences could I offer to entice kids to be more engaged in it and want to do it more, et cetera. So, um, you know, there's, there's obviously different kids, right? So there's some kids that just have no desire to do anything other than play a snare drum or play rudimental stuff. Sure. So I would always try to uh, expose them to other things too, to other areas of music and say, hey, I'm cool with you specializing, but we had a rule in both schools where you, if you wanted to be in marching band, you had to be in concert band too. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those things where, okay, you're going to be a part of this. So learn a couple scales, right? Learn how to play timpani, learn how, how to do these other things because you never know, you might like it. And I speak from experience because in high school, I could have cared less about a marimba, man. Like I faked it till I made it anytime <laughs> I was in concert band. And all I wanted to do was play a snare drum. I mean, and I really, you know, I, I certainly did pretty well doing that. But looking back, when I went to music school, I... I mean, I knew how to read, but I was horrible. I knew a couple scales, but I was horrible. And I really wish that I would have, you know, just dug into that a little bit more when I was of that age. I think I probably would have, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I probably would have really, really dug into the marimba a heck of a lot more if I was younger um, mm -hmm. and, and did that. So, you know, to, I'm always, I was always looking at the middle school, seeing who we could get in. Uh, my last couple of years at Carmel, I was able to develop uh, what we called the drum club. So it was a middle school thing where they came to the high school. We had like 30 kids in it by the end that they would come up and that really helped more kids kind of understand what they were doing when they got to the high school program and got us a few more students to join the marching band as well. Um, and really just helped the program along and just got kids, you know, better training. I mean, no offense to middle school band directors who I have the utmost respect for there's very few percussionists that are involved at, a, at the middle school band director level. So um, we were able to get a, one of our tech people in the middle school on a consistent basis to help them with the percussion end of things. Um, and, and uh, really just always trying to figure out, you know, again, that trajectory of the student where they were going to go so we could plan, you know, we would start looking probably halfway through the fall of, where people, you know, you, you start to, people show their colors, right? That what they're going to work at, you know, how they respond to the whole thing. So we would start to, to project for them the winter group, like, okay, I think so-and-so can go here. We probably want to maybe take them uh, maybe off of, of snare, put them on quads or, or move this person up to bass drum, whatever. Same thing with the front ensemble. Hey, this person who was maybe our auxiliary player really blossomed in the technique portions and they absolutely can make a vibe spot now or whatever. So you're always, I think, constantly assessing who can go where, looking at least a year down the road or at least a season at the worst case down the road, you know, winter to spring or winter to, to fall. Um, I want to go back to the middle school thing real quick. I could never teach middle school. I, it was, it is a skill and a, there are, are p the people that do that are absolutely amazing. I want to make that completely clear. I, I tried a few times and it was just the toughest age to teach. And the people that do that and do it well are incredible educators. <laughs> sometimes I, I get, sometimes I think my college students were too young. So <laughs> I have, I have, I have way of the same way. I'm in the same boat as you. Lots of respect for, for middle school or just any educator really. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, I, I have a question because what, what you're saying to me is so, so awesome. The sense of, um, it seems like a lot of what you're talking about and in, in, in your experiences of teaching and even arranging for that matter and designing would be, but centered around the idea of where the student can grow and what they can learn and how they can become better, which obviously is like great musically, but also great person because it shows them, you know, like what it is to feel good about themselves and, and to grow as a person. So there's a lot of really great things there. My, my question is, and this might be a little bit weird, but um, the vision for that, for like how you get from point A to point Z and all the points in between and how you grow them, is that, is that vision that you've had, um, is that set up by like benchmarks and goals you kind of preset? Like they should be playing at these levels or do you then, or do you see your students first and then kind of set goals for them over the next couple of years? Or do you already have like an idea of what they should, do? like how does that vision kind of come to life? Is it preset or is it kind of imp imp improv? I'd, I'd say it's a little bit of both. You know, okay. I think if you, 
there are certain skills that are needed to perform on X instrument. So you, you set those expectations um, based on what you think they can do. So, you, you know, you know that, that, you know, for lack of, let's just say that, you know, in order to play snare drum, you need to play paradiddles at this tempo. In order to play marimba, you know, you have to be able to hold four mallets and function independent, you know, whatever. You can set these sort of entry level skills or requirements, if you will. So in that sense, it's sort of pre-done, you know, in order to do this, you need to be able to do X. So that, but for the student standpoint, you know, you're always, at least I was always trying to think of, of them, you know, like, what are you able to achieve? And there are some students that want it so bad, but you, you know, are never going to get there. You know, that's just a truth. Um, so you, you are on, I was always honest with them. You know, I would never, uh, you know, sort of blow smoke to a student and say, well, if you do this, you know, it's like, Hey, this is what's needed. So if you want that and would ask, do you, is this what you want? Because if this is what you want, this is what it's going to take. Right. And here's my expectations of you over the next X amount of time to achieve that. Um, you, you, there's no cookie cutter for it all, you know, but there is, mm -hmm. you do need to be able to perform certain skills to, to be at a certain spot in the ensemble. But then, you know, again, you're just conscious of the student. You're, you're aware of how much they're doing. I would always just use facts, you know, Hey, you said you wanted to do this in all honesty, in our lessons, we've been doing the same thing for a month now. So that's not really <laughs> going to get you there. Oh man. You know, and there would be some yeah. times, you know, especially after auditions, you know, and, and, you know, again, facts, you know, I, I, every, I was there when I was their age and, and, you know, it, it's probably never going to change, but you know, their, it, their opinion of themselves is usually much higher and they're far better than, than, than they might be sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's really just using the facts and saying, Hey, you know, I need you to be able to do this, you know, and here are the tools you need to do that. I think that's an hugely important thing. It's not just, Hey, go do this. It's here is exactly what you need to do to achieve whatever these goals are. If you do that, you will set yourself up for as much success as you possibly can. Um, oh, oh, sorry, Mike, we're, we're both getting excited over the same thing. So it's great. Uh, 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 um, <laughs> uh, well, I think I just lost my train of thought because I laughed so hard. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, no, it's a. It, it, <laughs> it's well, okay. I, I just think it's but, a great thing to to take away is that for anybody watching, you know, the two, the two things that that kind of comes down to that you mentioned that are high expectations and actionable things that they can do yeah. to, to achieve those goals. I yeah. do think that's the kind of the most important thing, you know, is, mm -hmm. is, and is, well, Hey, the most important thing is honesty with the students, you know, right. is, is to say, Always. Hey, you know, yeah. They, and I would struggle. I wouldn't struggle with that. Some of my students would struggle with that because I think at times I would be more honest than they wanted to hear. And I would constantly come back to this comment of, look, if I just tell you you're great, I'm not doing you any favors, right? You might feel good about yourself in the moment. You might not have gotten constructive criticism in front of your peers. I do a lot of one on, you know, down the line type of playing and, and you know, logic being, hey, if you, if you can play in front of the people that know what you're doing intimately, then playing in front of 30,000 people in Lucas Oil is no big deal. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that, and it builds that confidence. And, and not only that, but then everybody hears all this commentary too. But I would always be brutally honest with them. And, and very honestly, there would be some, some students and then some parents eventually that didn't like that too much. But it was, hey, I, I would always come, I was like, I'm, I do the same to everybody. So I'm not, you know, not saying something to this student and, you know, saying too much to this. I always try mm -hmm. to make it very uh, judicial in that sense and very fair. Um, but, you know, again, I, if I just tell you that was great, what do you learn from that? You know, you're not. You learn that that was okay and whatever effort you put in worked rather than that was good. Here's what you need to do to make it better. Here's what you need to do to make it great, you know, and, and give them the tools for that. I think that's the other really important thing too. Not just that was bad, do it again. It's oh, that was bad, here's why. Or this could be better, here's why. I, I think on the flip side of this in some ways, because uh, this is, as Jordan said, I think this is pretty incredible and it's great to hear just the education side of, of this and, and that's what I love so much um on the flip side um I remember being my first year like teaching and you know on any given day half of what I did could have been wrong um and and I could have messed anything up and I know that's a lot of folks so um like when they're newer to what we're kind of doing so over the years I'm you know you've taught thousands of students right and so my my, my question would be 
how do you know as an educator if you're doing something wrong if you're leading that student down the wrong path on the wrong instrument or if you're hurting their technique or hurting them physically with what they're doing or if something's not connecting or even just the mental emotional side of like what you're asking of them to do how how do you know or what are the signs and what can you do to kind of like rectify that sure well a always it be truthful, you know, admit if you made a mistake and, and admit if you don't know something, you know, of course, um, you know, get yeah. somebody in there that can function in that role or, or whatever, if you can, or find the resources, whatever. So there's, there's that. Um, how do you know if you're doing it wrong? If you, you know, if you're not getting the result that you want, then you probably need to adjust your approach in some sense, you know, um, if you, you know, philosophically, it, it, to know that you're doing it wrong is if it's not working, you know, did, did I just, you know, easy maybe analogy, play faster. Well, that didn't fix it. Okay, that's probably not the right thing then. Play slower. Well, okay, maybe this, play louder, play softer. Um, small tangent there, right? So it's, it's not hard in that sense because there's only four choices. Too loud, too soft, too fast, too slow, right? That's, that's ensemble in a nutshell, right, of, of doing that. So try those things. You know, those are four things to see if you're doing it right. You know what I mean? Play louder, that didn't work. Okay, play a little bit softer. Oh, that seems better. Okay, we're going to stick with that and we're going to get nuanced within that. Um, play faster, play slower, same kind of thing. Um, the philosophical end is the weird end, right? Because, you know, I, I, I would say this when I was in college too. So I went back to college um, when I was 31 years old. So I'd already been teaching for a long time. And it was an interesting thing to go back to school after having been an educator for a long time. It, it, it took me a minute to <laughs> learn how to learn again, I guess, you know, right. But I clearly had some, some opinions on how to teach and how to be taught in that sense too. So I had, you know, and, and all great professors, doctorates, the whole thing, but people that, you know, taught the book, but not the class. So I think you have to be very aware of your audience, you know, and it's not enough to, okay, Tuesday, we do this, Thursday, we do this. And then next week, we're supposed to go into this. And then just to, to follow the book the whole time, you've really got to listen to your audience. And that's with anything, right? If, if, if whatever methodology you're using, let's say that you're super high energy and the most positive person in the world, and then people are rolling their eyes at you or whatever. All right, that might not be, you might not be comfortable doing something other than that. So you've got to figure out a way within you to do something different that will work, you know, and, and, you know, your feedback is in the results, right? Like that's your answer, Mike, you know, is if, if you're doing it right, you will get the results. If you're not doing it correctly, or if there's a better way, well, there's probably always a better way in a sense, but right. um, you know, uh, you will get the desired results that you want or you won't. Um, so yeah, just listen to the kids, listen to the audience, listen to, you know, I think a lot of, of newer instructors too, depending, especially if they're experienced, they're going to, they might not take, into account all the resources that are there. Judge feedback is huge in our world, right? Like, and you may, there's so many people that, that, that you know, clearly have an opinion on how to do something, right? But the person that's writing down a score, regardless of what you may think of them, has an opinion about something that you are heavily involved in. So take mm -hmm. it all to heart, listen to it, do what they're asking, you know, in the sense of, they are familiar with the sheets, so that can help you a ton in terms of fixing whatever problems are out there. Right. You know, don't be so stubborn or married to stuff in the program that you can't change it. Mm -hmm. You know, the ability to, to be fluid and to be adaptive is half of the battle as a teacher, no matter what idiom you're in. So, so allow yourself to do that. Allow yourself to be open to feedback and criticism, just as you had to ask your kids to be open to feedback and criticism. Uh, and that can help a ton. I, I get the feeling that what you're kind of, what, what, what you're talking about being, you know, being honest with your students and, and having that kind of uh, relationship where you're honest with them and there's kind of clear communication and transparency um, would would then allow for like if it, from the from the non ability talent size side from the from the side of when you have students who can achieve but are choosing or not able to in that day or in that moment or who need that that extra love i'm assuming that you found like the environment of what you're creating helps encourage them to talk about those things absolutely is that is that yeah. I mean, you, is that something that i'm assuming that students ever talked about yeah we would you know i would 
basically say, hey, there's an open door policy. You know, I mean, if you ever have a question, yeah. please ask. You know, there would cool. be, you know, there is a bit of training that goes along with that. I think of the appropriate time to ask certain of questions. Um, you know, and and I would always, I would never shut anybody down. You know, in the sense, like I'm not going to answer that question, but it would be like, hey, now is not an appropriate time for that. Right. Come sure. see me after sure. rehearsal or whatever. You know, so there's some training that goes along and. and Listen, as a little brass player, we got that. I got it all the time, so I get yeah. it. Uh, yeah. We, uh, um, very, very cool. Uh, thank, I mean, thank you. I, I was, I was just really curious about that because you know, yeah. uh, Amaya and I've only been doing this for a couple of years. So I mean, those are the things I think about a lot of times more than the music when I go home. I think about did I set that student up for success or was that conversation oh yeah handled handled well? And I find I, myself thinking about that way more than the right now. It, there were. <laughs> You know, and I even do it professionally now. I mean, there's, you stay true to yourself is the biggest part of it, right? Like speak to others as you want to be spoken to, all those kinds of mm -hmm. things. But, you know, there's certain times where you've got to press a little bit to get results, you know, and you might have, like there are times where I would look back and luckily, you know, most of them paid off. You know, there were certainly some failures in there, but, um, you know, you start to, you, you learn the student, you learn the vibe of the room and, and you know that you can dig in a little bit more and you know that you can press. And then, you know, if you're going to give that tough love, then you've got to be able to, to give the, the sort of rewards of that and the, the, the pump up part too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, man, I, I, I think way too much about that sometimes. You know? <laughs> it's, it's something that I would critique myself constantly of, of, you know, how was that delivery? Mm, not quite what I wanted there. You know, it's like, right. <laughs> I think of the Robin Williams live at the Met from years ago when he talked about his kids standing in a mirror, like practicing his emotions or something like that, you know, like, ah! no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but there's, you know, there's calculated things there too, but then, you know, teaching is emotional too. So there were yeah. times where, you know, you, you, I did act on emotion and it was correct. And, and there were times where, you know, I didn't get the de desired result that I wanted, you know, and then there's where you circle back with, you know, the specific student or the group or whatever, and just say, hey, you know, we, you know, whatever, it, it worked or it didn't work. And here's why. So here's what we're going to do to address that. So. It's fantastic. I, yeah, I, they, I mean, thanks for being, thanks mm -hmm. for talking about that, because that, because that, 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 that's really, really insightful. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to, I want to circle back to your comments about, um, well, about judges, but about feedback, right? So based on what you're, you know, the principles that you've already talked about, honesty, about transparency, you know, having that feedback is not just about a number, I'm assuming, but, but also about how do you improve the quality of things. So whenever you, whenever you get a tape, how do you distill those things, those comments, the feedback? Um, how do you distill those things and make a plan for, you know, the upcoming weeks? Yeah, usually, you know, uh, I would be looking for feedback on things that I already kind of knew about that were problems or that I wasn't sure about. Um, you know, if we look at the design standpoint and most of my design was again in the winter time, not in the fall. Sure. Um, it's not most all of my design stuff for Carmel or Avon was in the winter. Um, but you know, even in the fall sense, right. I'm the one that's, that's implementing changes. I'm doing all the things right. that are affecting that, you know, there were times where, you know, it was on me to, to do a really small rewrite or something like that. Um, or whatever, but you're also clearing out the ensemble too. There are times where like we're working in ensemble and it's like, Hey, this isn't, it's, it's a little muddy, you know, and it's, it's notes on a page and, and clearly they serve a purpose, but you know, develop the relationship with the arranger to, to get that trust, to know that you can, yeah. you know, treat their music appropriately and professionally and still do it justice and everything. Um, so yeah, I, I would usually have key moments that I wanted to get that feedback on anyway. And then I would usually, if there was a critique situation, you know, pick out moments on the tape where I wanted to chat about and say, hey, what about this? Either provide clarity to the judge in critique um, sure. of what they were hearing and here's our plans for that. What do you think? Um, stuff like that. But, you know, listening, I would always listen with a pad and paper um, and I would take notes, you know, especially, you know, again, on those moments that I knew might be questionable or something like that. Or if there was a tear, let's try to figure out what happened via the tape and, and all of that if we didn't, weren't able to do it in real time. Having judged, you know, and I, I was this way when I was a young teacher too, um, probably did it a few times when I was an older teacher as well, but you know, the judge gave you what they thought on the tape. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I remember going into critique one time when I was super green. So what'd you think? And it was like, dude, I told you what I thought on the tape. So. <laughs> 
and that was four hours ago. So I, you know, <laughs> right, right. Um, Seen a so, since then. Yeah, you know, so you know, again, having specific things to talk about is is huge, and to manage that critique time really well. Um, Jay Webb used to always say, you know, that the tape was their time, critique is my time. So I get to ask questions, I get to clarify, I get to seek knowledge from them, you know, more so than what they maybe gave me on the tape. So I always thought, you know, as I learned, I always thought that was a great tool, you know, um, certainly if, if, if they're going to go for a minute, let them go because, you know, you want to make sure that they're heard too. But I always appreciate the way Jay managed the critique. So, but back to the tape thing, just be open, right? Listen to their comments you know, and depending, it's a first read sometimes, so they, they could be wrong, you know, but just sure. open up your mind that they could very well be right. And they're in there, you know, assessing that for a reason. They're trained in that. Um, so allow them the opportunity to, to help you as much as you possibly can. And, and I think you can learn quite a bit that way. You know, and again, there, there might be moments of like, eh, and okay, take it or leave it. But, sure. you know, 90% of the time, you're going to get a lot of great feedback. And especially to that first read that, you know, you may have it final sometimes. So if, if that's the case, you want to be able to distill any issues that somebody would see on a first read that's not awkward or anything like that. So you change the design. Um, oh, I had a good, another good point, but I forgot it. Anyway, <laughs> we'll come back. Thank to you. It. Thank you about the, oh, go ahead, Holly. Go ahead. To follow up with the critique, what are some suggestions for new directors or new percussion staff on like, like how to go into critique, like any good questions or like, I don't know. I feel like that's one of the hardest things for new instructors and new directors is you hear a tape. What do you do when you go into critique? Cause I feel like we hear the, you go in and it's your turn to sort of ask questions. You're not really telling, they're not telling you their thoughts cause they did that already. But what do you talk about? Yeah, I, I would always have questions about the tape, you know, ask them to clarify a few things. Um, be able to explain some things, like I said, if, if there was a question about something, you know, be able to address as many concerns that they had on the tape in the critique. You know, it's, it's not an argument in that sense, but if you think of a courtroom kind of exchange, right, it's your turn to present your case in that sense. Uh, and it's very few, you know, very rare that you get that opportunity, you know, and, and certainly um, be able to present yourself professionally and, and, and properly in that sense, you know, people that come in guns blazing never goes over well. Um, I was never a huge fan of bringing in, you know, a, a huge posse into critique, so to speak. You know? I, yeah. You know, I, <laughs> you know, in, unless I was starting to groom somebody, you know, I would usually be myself and one other person, maybe a, a third, depending, you know, somebody who was a younger staff member that, I knew I wanted to groom into a, a, a role that they would want to see how this is done a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I would always, again, just try to have some questions to ask. And, and I know that's not a direct answer, uh, Holly, but it's, it's the tape will give you the questions that you need, you know, and, and be able to provide clarity to the judge at that point with that. Um, it's okay if you don't use all the time. Some people would say, hey, you got to max out. But, you know, if, if you get to a point where there's nothing to talk about, then it's okay. You know, right. um, try to fill it up because it's limited, you know, but um, you certainly too, if, if we look at sort of the winner side of things, you know, you're going in with, you know, a visual judge, a GE judge and a music judge. So there's three different stations, right? So um, have your commentary accordingly, right? Like you're listening to that tape. I would always just do a plus minus and be able to, to you know, here are their positive comments, here are their negative comments. Um, you know, some of the negative comments might not need addressing, some of them might need more than others. Some of the positive comments might need addressing, might not need addressing, you know, so be able to do that and formulate a plan. Uh, I think the worst thing you can do to walk into a critique is not have listened to the tape. Mm -hmm. um, there are times where it's not, a, you know, you, there were tech issues or you were the last group on and all of a sudden you're in critique. So just be honest with them, hey, I didn't have a chance to listen to the tape yet. You know, we had a bloody nose and, a, you know, this and that and I had to right. whatever. Cool. So be honest with them. Um, you know, you know, try to get, try to just drum up conversation that way and then say, Hey, there's a couple of things I wanted to make sure you understood about the show. Uh, but, and talk caption appropriately too, you know, like you don't need to necessarily tell the visual guy, the whole story of the, the effect arc of the show, you know, they little snippet, you know, have a 20 second pitch to get them in the loop, but you know, you're going to spend more time with the GE person on that and the music person on the intricacies of your book and all that kind of stuff too. So. Uh, just a random question um, uh, on the flip side of judging. 
Um, we're asking about, you know, if, if you're an educator, if you get critique and information and, and, and whatnot, but for maybe those who are young at judging or for those who are just getting into that kind of business of judging, is there a certain thing you always try to do in each tape? Is there like, is there something you always make a point to make sure like on every tape you give as an evaluator that you say? Um, yes. I mean, you, you just try to make sure you just keep a mental tally that you've commented on the entire ensemble, you know, whatever your uh, caption is. So, you know, judging percussion, you know, and tried sometimes more successful than others, obviously, uh, especially if you look at some of the feedback, you know, you never said anything about the pit. And then in my mind, it was like, wow, I thought I had three or four really great moments there with that, whatever. But, um, you really just try to have that mental checklist of, you know, everybody. Um, I will say there were, there were times where I, I remember judging the show out in Missouri once and uh, uh, you get, it's a, full day drumline show and you're giving caption awards at the end of this full day. I mean, literally eight to eight. Was it called Mazingo by any it chance? It is. It absolutely is. I'm, yeah. I'm from, I'm from that city. I'm oh, no St. way. St. Peter's, yeah. Missouri. Oh man. Yeah. So Jeff actually has become a great friend of mine too over the years, but, um, <laughs> Oh uh, yeah. Mazingo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Jeff Mazingo. Um, yeah. But anyway, there was, I don't know if we did it one time, but those he had brought in, at the, you know, he brought in great guys for that, that or great judges for that show. And it was either they told me or we actually did it one year, but we gave best symbol line to a group that didn't have a symbol line. <laughs> <laughs> you just sort of forget, you know, like was we got it the, the cleanest? end of the day. I mean, uh, clearly, yeah, <laughs> no mistakes in that symbol line. That's, that's what, what does that say about all the other shows? Yeah, but you know, it's you're right. Yeah, right. Um, that's what I. <laughs> yeah. So you know, again, you're just you're, you're trying to keep that mental checklist that you've addressed, you know, quote unquote, checked every box in a sense. You know, have I. Have I looked into you know the techniques they're using? Have I addressed the the, the physical uh, distance between the pit, you know, or whatever the, some of the ensemble issues that they might be dealing with, you know? And and you know, I felt like the judging craft was something that I got better with every year, and still had still have a ton to learn about um, just being better. You know, it's it, it you I do think this uh, this is a little off topic, but if you're going to be judged, you should judge. You know, you should really, hmm. you know, ex understand what those people are going through because it's a hard gig, man, like to talk in real time. And certainly there's words you have to use, you know, you, there's, you know, you know, rubric of language that is part of, the, of that, that it's, it's Most tough some to all. Yeah, like. you know, it's tough to do that. It really is. And it's the people that are good at it are, are practiced and, and, and are right. very skilled at it. And, uh, you know, again, one of those like, man, it's, you every time the tape is just money, you know, I, I, I get something out of listening to this tape from these people every time. But uh, yeah, I mean, really just, just again, listen to judges that you just like music, right? Like if you like a certain artist, you're going to emulate that in some way, shape or form. If you like a certain composer and you write music, you're going to probably steal and, and borrow licks and all of that. Same thing, man, listen to other judges tapes and, and what made that such a great tape? Was it the d delivery? Was it that it was uplifting? Was it that there was no real right. negative comments, even though they put us last, you know what I mean? Or, but they, they, they communicated in a way that was very supportive, even though there was a lot of, of constructive criticism going on or negative comments. Um, yeah, study, study. That's probably the, the bottom line. Yeah. Just like, I guess, basically with anything we do, right? It, it, yeah, it's, a, it's an acquired skill. It is not... Yeah, it's an acquired skill, like study, listen to people, talk mm -hmm. to people about that craft, about, you know, what, how are you able to do this for so long? And that's whether that's 12 minutes, whether that's for eight groups, whether that's for 30 groups, you know, I got better and better at taking notes. I got better and better at recalling things. It's just a, it's a mind skill. I mean, you got to flex that muscle basically, you know? Right. Right. I know uh, a lot of circuits nowadays are offering, um, like the ability to shadow for younger people. So sure, if anybody's yeah. interested in, in doing that, that's a great way to just kind of get started. Hey, I want to yep. shadow somebody and talk to them as they go. Absolutely. Through. Yep. So yeah, cool. that was my first judging gig ever, Jordan. I asked, really? yeah, I, I, I just, I, there was a local, local competition and I just reached out and said, Hey, could I just jump in the press box and just get a copy of the sheets and learn? And they're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of cool. And that was, I mean, I was horribly off, but, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think and, and I think this is Jeff. Maybe uh, this is, maybe there's some truth of this, and and maybe, um, I have found that a lot of times that 
for young folks who are trying to learn things, we think it's really, really far away. But it's a lot of times if you just ask, there's a lot of people like who, there's a lot of people like yourself who would be interested in just having a conversation and meeting with them and talking. Is that something you find to happen um, with, with kind of like what makes people great? I, I don't know anybody that hasn't sought other people that is successful, you know, I mean, and that, that's anything, mm -hmm. um, you know, so yes is the short answer. I mean, just ask, I mean, the worst thing that you're going to get is no, right. but then right. keep asking, you know, I mean, I look at, at my evolution as wherever I am today, you know, I couldn't have done it without a million other people, you know, and people, right. some people, like I was a puppy dog too, whether it was me as I was 16 years old, watching guys that were 21 and the blue devils play and me just kind of let me play with you. Let me do this. You know, let me show me this thing. You know, and I was that annoying person that way. And then as I started teaching, I just watched and learned as much as I could. Um, you know, what, why, how did I like to be taught? What did I like about that experience? Can I emulate that? How do I adopt that and be part of my own sort of philosophy and pedagogy? Um, you know, for the judging thing, yes, ask, shadow, learn. Um, I do think that, you know, and there's lots of resources out there now too. Like everybody's kind of, there's judging academies and there's, you know, right. especially now, you know, there's all sorts of resources out there. I do think one of the hardest parts of judging, while the commentary is difficult, I think numbers management is a tough, tough thing, you know, especially in larger shows and things like that. And that's something that I struggled with uh, to begin with. I got better as it went, um, but it's tough. And especially, you know, you're under the gun. You, you have a limited amount of time to write down a number um, and that the systems have evolved in a way to make it a little bit easier. You know, there's some places that I, and I agree with this hundred percent that they hold sheets for the first couple of groups because it gives you a benchmark. It gives you an opportunity to say, mm, sure. I'm going to, I'm going to start here, but that was really high or really low. So I can adjust accordingly. Um, I think that's a very smart thing. It doesn't change, you know, your feedback or, or usually it wouldn't change your placement, but it allows you the opportunity to assign the right number in the end. Um, this may be a question later, but I do think that competitive music is an awesome tool to teach skills. It's not the reason to do it, but it can really just provide, you know, hey, we started at a 70 and we ended at a 90. Mm -hmm. So that's a quantifiable result that you can use with the students too. So uh, I think comp competition in that sense is very good. Um, I know that, uh, you know, at Butler, there was a couple the teachers that would be like this whole competitive music thing. I don't understand that. I'm like, you competed to get your job, didn't you? you right. Compete to get a spot in a symphony. Mm -hmm. You know, you competed to get a scholarship to go to school to get your job. You know, so that it's it's everywhere and it's quantifiable. So there's nothing wrong, I think, with using that as a very positive tool um, with students too. So and that comes from the judging community, obviously. So. Right. Well said. Well said. I. <laughs> I want to back way up. Uh, I had a question at the very beginning. Going way back. <laughs> way, way back. <laughs> About 40 minutes ago. Um, uh, Jeff, you mentioned your collaboration with uh, J Webb and Mike McIntosh. And the, you know, they're doing the arranging, you're doing the, the educational side with those groups. What was that collaboration like as you were beginning the season um, in terms of, I guess, what I'm thinking is like skills, uh, skill level, those things. And then yep. something you referenced um, just a little while ago was also mid season when you're, when you're clarifying, how do you, um, yep. what's your working relationship like with those people? So with Jay, he was hands-on. So he was the head band director. He actually hired me at Avon to start to take over the percussion program so he could be more of a head band director. So he was still doing the arranging. So he obviously saw the progression of the students. So we would chat quite often in real time or, you know, after rehearsal over drinks or whatever to here's what we think we should do. And he would tweak the ensemble accordingly. I would certainly, you know, take a diddle out here and there or change a part that didn't affect the overall scope of things without issue. You know, if he had a problem, he'd let me know and we'd go from there, you know, vice versa. Hey man, I think you really need to take a look at this part. They're never hitting it. Uh, I don't, this is a wholesale change. This is, you know, a minor change or whatever. And we would just communicate that way. Uh, with, Mike at Carmel, he was, was from a distance, um, still a very good friend. So we had, we had a good rapport and everything. Oh. All right. Uh, sorry about that, everybody. We had a little uh, technology blip again. Um, sorry about that. So Jeff, we were talking yeah. about, I know I got yeah, so I into did. Jay um, and talking yeah. about that. So, but. you know, we just communication really fixed mm -hmm most of that you know that where it would be different with with mike a little bit was you know he and he was able to come out to band camp a little bit more so he sort of saw the progressions over the years a little bit more when he first 
Um, when I first took over, he maybe he made less trips out. So we were able to get him out more as my sort of tenure progressed. And it's something we wanted to do the whole time. And then his, we started to be able to get his schedule to open up whatever. We just worked out to where he could sort of see that progression a little bit more. But initially, right, if, if, if you're communicating skills to a designer, it's like, hey, for, you know, the center to marimbos, you know, here's the general skill set. And we would start to sort of deal with WGI classifications in a way, you know, like baseline is going to be a strong open line, snare line is a world thing, quads are, you know, in between open and world, whatever. And just, you know, if he ever wrote something that wasn't going to be achievable or, you know, was under them too, it would be that kind of thing too, like give it a look. And, you know, you there's ways to kind of beef up parts and even to sort of of, of hose parts without really changing anything but the skill set that's required from the students. It doesn't even necessarily change rhythmically sometimes or, or even, you know, musically, you wouldn't even know, if you weren't a percussionist, you probably wouldn't even notice that it was different, which is, you know, taking out or adding a flam or something like that, changing sure. a sticking to make it more challenging or slightly easier or whatever. So lots of those things I kind of had the freedom to do and was kind of expected to do just because, you know, there's bigger fish to fry from those guys' standpoint, um, you know, and that's what my job entailed. So. Uh, I think in the outset, setting us up for success was always just making sure that those initial skill sets were in place and, and we sort of understood the baseline. And, uh, you know, both Jay and Mike did a great job of increasing the demand as the show went on, you mm -hmm. know, knowing that, you know, the opener is the first thing that we're getting or whatever. So it's maybe a little bit easier, depending on what the needs of the show were. But you would see, you know, harder skills pop up later in the show just because the students got more advanced. So, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I I love that concept. I, I love the concept of a movement being a little bit harder in the show, like as you might get to it um, and being able to like address technical skills then. I, do you ever find yourself doing that like years out in advance to say, in two years from now, I need everyone to do this thing yes, for sure? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there were some things that, you know, hey, I want to be able to play like this speed of a role or something like that. Like there's an idea I have for the winter show that I want you guys to start working on now. Um, cool. there were certainly seeds planted that way for sure, you know, and, and, uh, I'm trying to think of a year that it manifested. I can't think of anything specific, but yeah, we would certainly be saying, Hey, start to do this, start to look at this, cool. figure out how to do this stick toss, figure out how to do this thing or, or whatever. If there was an idea that we had, and sometimes they manifested well. And sometimes it was like, no, that idea's not going to work, but at least we had the seeds planted and we could, and the kids got more skill out of it regardless. So. And, and I assume I, and doing it that early or like presenting it earlier like that would, I guess, be a little bit more risk-free in the sense yeah. of like it wouldn't affect the, necessarily the show if you're actually in it exactly. months later. Yeah. Cool. You know, and, and there was, there were things too that we started to, there were exercises that I would have them learn that we may never play kind of thing, but it was just, we learned it because, you know, like if I look at band camp and weather and all of that, you know, it's rare that you have in the early stages, just given everybody's schedules that you have your full show to work on when there's a rain delay. You know, so there's those fun things that we would do. So I would always be able to plant seeds that way um, and or like, hey, this is something that maybe we won't do this year, but we might get to next year. Let's let me teach you these couple skills or whatever it's to. So yeah, you always I always sort of have those things in our hip pocket to be able to to do on a whim, if you will, to uh, just prepare for the future and to always make it educational and always move it along in a way too. Sometimes when I hear percussionists talk about things like that, it reminds me of how similar percussion and color guard are, even though they feel like opposites sometimes. And like, even like during this season, you don't really see that, but when you talk about behind the scenes stuff and the like, we're just gonna give them this skill, it might not be great right now, but we're, we're working towards this winter season, we're working towards next fall, or it, it's exactly the same things that like I, I view in the color guard world and a lot of other color guard people do, which you, you would know, but it's just interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you really like, I mean, Rosie, my wife is masterful at, at everything that we're talking about. I've learned a ton from her, you know, just watching the way that she ran her program at Carmel. You know, the same thing, right? Like you want to be able to throw a six. All right. So, Hey, you can barely throw a quad, but here's how you can now throw a five and a six. Here's how to do a two turn. You're, you're whatever you're, you're planting those seeds for people to be able to get that. And then, you know, in the same sense of you're looking at a saber or a rifle line, I'm looking at a snare or a quad line kind of thing. It's the, the sort of more skilled positions. Here's yeah. what we want to be able to do. Start working on them now, you know, go drop that thing a thousand times and then figure <laughs> out how to catch it so you can do that next year or whatever, you so, know? And, and I think, you know, again, you're, if you're not 
looking ahead, you're going to certainly find yourself behind at some point. So it is that planning for the future that's that's paramount. And that's in any order, whether it's college, whether it's high school, whether it's drum corps, you know, you, you've got to be able to know, you should hopefully know that, know your group a year in advance almost, you know, because you know who's graduating, you know who's going to fill out those positions and still be able to fill out your ensemble. If not, you're going to be floundering. I always think of it kind of like a, uh, when I when I plan my roster, and Jordan, you've seen it before, it's always, it's usually a year in advance and, and very much a list of random names and instruments that kind of form into like a football team, like a roster, like this person would be great at this position and this and this, you yeah. know, if you're working on various things. Um, do you find that to be the case ever when transitioning, like, like the students, like from bass drum to snare drum to quads to like that same ideology? I'm not exactly sure I understand your question. Oh yeah, um, well, it's kind of like earlier. So, do you ever have a? Sorry, let me rephrase. Sorry, uh, earlier we were talking um, based on students' abilities, right? Within what they can do, um, like we try to set them up for success. Do you ever see that matching, like, with the vision of like where they can go with the instruments, what they're playing, and the tech, and and that as well? Yeah, like, I mean, just, usually, yeah, I see what you're saying. Usually, you're you're setting them on a path that will take them to where they want to go. So yes, I mean, in terms of an instrument standpoint, you know, let's look at the progression of, you know, somebody who's coming in with not a lot of experience, you know, they're going to either be a single tenor or a cymbal player if they want to be in the battery, or maybe they're not ready for that yet. Like their frame is not ready to carry a drum or something like that. So, Hey, we're going to put you, you don't know how to read music, right? So we're right. taking that. You're going to be an auxiliary player where I can teach you how to read quarter notes. I can teach you how to read basic music stuff right. and set you up for that success. And then as cool. you start to get better there, I can start to add more parts to you, all that. And then cool. you might find that you initially wanted to be in the battery, but being in the pit, you saw how cool it was to play a melody. So you want to play vibes. Cool. Let's get you there. So, yeah, I mean, the, the student, you know, you would try to, dictate the path for the student, but it's always checking in with them to, to make sure that they're doing what they want to do. You know, cool. you got to push a little bit. And I would take that same approach with lessons too. You know, the, Hey, this is your lesson. What do you want to do? But I'm still <laughs> sort of the parent and the teacher in this case, you know, literally obviously the teacher, but you know, I know you want to do this, but in order to do that, here's the path we need to take to get there. You know, cool. so bear with me real quick while we do a couple of things to set some groundwork and then we can start to push over here a little bit and then start to diversify a little bit more. So, even just that little bit like that helps so much i mean in, in holly you've been mentioning that how that kind of ties into guard you know because a lot you know so, there's so many directors who don't have that guard or professional experience so i agree holly i think there's a lot of similarities in the sense of um like they seem to be very specific i i noticed you know you, you can tell visually when a guard when someone in guards off as opposed to maybe a baritone player and musically uh, it's 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 a very interesting thing to how that I, I i agree that's a fascinating kind of comparison between the two well there's a i think too there's obviously there's such a visual element to the color guard but to drums as well you know you can't fake any of that yeah you know right. what i mean there's right. no way to fake any of it you know you <laughs> i can put I, I can look like i'm marching a horn for a whole show if you put me in why because i all i gotta no offense all i gotta do is breathe you know <laughs> But you know, oh. so it's <laughs> there is you know and and I think that you know back to the the young director thing. There's a lot of pitfalls that happen because I don't know that everybody realizes the difficulty that goes into playing and marching a drum or playing a marimba or throwing a flag and a saber. There's so many things you know, you know. Like I was asked at some point, well, why why can't you put you know all these people on snare drum and just write the parts differently it's like well, yeah you could but then you're going to look at a line of eight people and four of them are going to be doing this and other the other four might just have their sticks in you know what i mean like right, right. is that what we want to do you know is that the the what we want to convey so there were other routes that i took other than that now certainly you know i'm not one to say you can't do anything but that's, I don't know. There, no. it, it, it's very easy to underestimate the difficulty of anything that you're not familiar with. Right. So sure. I, I would caution folks, you know, I would obviously recommend young directors to try to get specialists in if they can, even if it's one, you know, maybe you can't get a full staff of percussion folks or a full color guard staff, but at least get one person that specializes in that world because it's a whole different world that you may not know about. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, yeah, you took your methods class and yeah, you've been doing this for a long time or whatever. 
but you know, specialists are specialists for a reason, just like exactly. you're a, a low brass person or you're a high brass person or whatever. So, for sure, man, Jeff, I can't thank you enough for your time yes. today. This has oh, been this has been delightful. I have been jotting down multiple notes of mm -hmm. things I want to kind of awesome. come back to and explore myself. So thank you for your time. Uh, before we ask pleasure, guys. Our, our last couple of questions here, I want to remind everybody that we have design details on every Friday as well. So we've been working through a show for Fort Zumwalt East in Missouri. We started with the planning process. Mike took us through the arranging process. Uh, Jeff Larch took us through the percussion arranging process. Holly and I are going to take you into visual land next week and talk about what that looks like. So if that's something that interests you or you want to learn a little bit more, like if you're a percussionist and want to learn how to broaden your horizons and collaborate with your visual staff in a, in a more effective way, it could be a great, great thing to watch. Um, so you can check us out there. You can check out our old videos on musiceffectdesign.com as well. Uh, so, so Jeff, uh, first off, where can people go to learn a little bit more about you and what you do? You can go to my incredibly outdated website of jeffclean.com. Uh, I made it in iWeb years ago and it's horribly outdated, but it's got a bio on there. I don't even think it's updated with my Yamaha stuff uh, at this point, but um, I do have a, a number of solos that I've published. Uh, I do have an instructional snare drum book called The Next Level uh, and a DVD available. I have a signature stick out with Vic Firth as well. All of that's available on the website. Um, I still do, you know, some consulting and things like that, but I'm certainly transitioning kind of out of that world. But Happy to chat with folks. Uh, certainly, this was very, very enjoyable. Thanks again, you guys, for having me on. Um, but yeah, that's kind of your go-to. My email address at that website is just jeff at jeffqueen.com. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little slow responding to those emails these days, but I do get back to everybody. If you want to fire off a question or anything like that, feel free. Um, there you go. I can vouch for you. He does respond to that email. <laughs> I can vouch. Cool. Uh, and then just the last thing, uh, last words for aspiring percussion educators, arrangers, people who are watching tonight. Be humble, learn, be cool. You know, I mean, it's, there's so many resources out there. So, you know, you, you can only learn what you don't know, you know, so learn everything. And then my advice would be to really try to ingest as much of that as you can to formulate your own opinions. You know, I, there's a lot of noise out there because of, of how easy doing this type of thing is. So, you know, listen to everybody, but then make educated opinions based on, on what you feel in your gut on, on what to sort of adapt into your own vernacular and into your own teachings, but stay humble. You know, the, the more that you can learn, uh, the better, you know, you can learn what you don't want to do. There's certainly something to be said for that as well. Um, you know, and then the be cool part, and this is the last thing I guess I'll leave you with this entire world, i.e. the globe, the sphere that we live on is small and it gets smaller and smaller every day. And our pageantry world, this little thing is incredibly small. You have no idea when you're going to work with somebody else again, when your paths are going to cross and really do your best not to burn any bridges and just be cool to people. You know, you never know when, you know, you could help somebody or somebody could help you because of an experience that you had, you know, and you never know who's watching. You know, there are mm -hmm. students out there that, that, you know, will continue on and do great things. And, and it could be because of one thing that you said to them at some point. Um, so just be mindful of that. Be mindful of the platform that you have to hopefully do good things in the world and not, uh, you know, yeah, just not, be cool <laughs> and be <laughs> humble uh, is, is I think probably the best advice you can give. And the world is very, very small. So, awesome. great. Uh, it's fun to get, get percussion advice and life advice. I love it. Yeah, it's all. I mean, it's all life advice, right? Yeah, and you know, I think about last little thing in terms of the arranging thing. You know, just be your own best and worst critic. You know, get insight from other people and and change it if it needs to be changed. You know, there was. I, I'll tell you this. I've never regretted changing something, but mm. there's times where I've regretted holding on to some, Not some parts. Something. I think they're going to get it. No, they're not. You know, there, there's, I mean that in, in a diss, you know what I mean? If, if you're, trust your gut, you know what I mean? And if, if the thought is there to potentially change something, listen to it. You know, like I, like I said, I've never regretted changing a part, but there are some times where it was like, that wasn't as good as it could have been. And, and that's on me. That's my fault. So I, I, I own those experiences quite a bit and I, I try to avoid them 
as much as I can in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, <laughs> again, thank you, Jeff. For those of you watching thank you. tonight, thank you for, for watching. We hope you got as much out of this as we have. Um, and maybe yeah, hope everybody stay safe out there. Real Absolutely. pleasure. Cool. Awesome, All guys. Right. Take care. Everybody. Have a thank good one. you. See you Friday.